Hey, thanks for joining us. I'm Morgan here with Arna. And today we're talking to Megan Davis. She's a storyteller who lives in Australia, an artist. She owns her own company and she focuses on storytelling for innovation and all of the different ways we can think about stories. Hmm. Uh, yeah. And what did you think of the the conversation and what stood out to you, Arna? Yeah, well, it ended actually with me coming up with all these ideas for 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 the podcast. I was like, oh yeah. <laughs> that would be so uh, cool. That would be so cool. Um I think the last thing was the we should invite a Bollywood director talking about storytelling um because of the you know the different kind of ways in different cultures people use stories and tell stories and so stories are are so fundamental to everything uh, I think I call it the the uh, the theory of everything <laughs> <laughs> yeah I think you use that phrase yeah so I, I that's that was what it sparked for me because I was yeah. like yeah I yeah I also had a a connection light bulb moment um where she talks about uh stories and in connecting people and and that also sparked something in me and uh and that was and I was also thinking about the difference of stories because of course we watch tv series or read books or whatever however we consume our stories and not all stories impact me but then she was saying that the good stories do make an impact and talking to her of course ins inspired you it gave you lots of new ideas it gave me a light bulb moment um, and I think that's maybe going to be my, my new metric on how I measure a story. Like, did it impact me? Yeah. Um, and the other thing is that we, we you know, she starts saying that she's an explorer mm -hmm. and, uh, and it is something that, uh, I mean, for her, it's really specific because she, she, she really, you know, she sees herself as an explorer and, uh, and, and that very back because, because of her, her, her kind of, uh, storytelling kind of um lens it all makes sense to her and so that's the that's something that a lot of the people that are on this podcast not no no not a lot of them, all of the people that are on this podcast they all have a varied background and in a way they are all explorers in a way but most people don't realize it so they they don't they don't look back and say oh yeah this is what i've learned and everything kind of it's a circular thing so her way of thinking about stories is in a circular thing, way so not a hero's journey not a beginning middle and end but a circular mm -hmm. uh event that that to me was also really uh that's an interesting I, I that kind of i'll keep thinking about that from now on like how is that kind of building yeah how is that story circular because you end up at the same place Anyway, she tells the whole uh, Wizard of Oz story, which is great. So that's good to hear because yeah. I'm like, oh yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, there's a there's a lot there's a lot of great uh, there's a lot of great little moments and stories along the way. Yeah, the bed there's a bed blog. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> the bed uh, blog. yeah, yeah. There, I didn't ask, but I, that reminded me of uh, because that was. Uh, it was about 11 years ago or so that she mm -hmm. talked about this and uh, it reminded me of couch surfing. Yeah. You remember that? There was this, I think it must have yeah. been the same era somewhat where we Defin No, we're definitely. Involved. Yeah. Cause I was involved in that as well back then. So yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you love sleeping on strangers couches. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. You get so many good stories, but, uh, yeah, but I think, surfing. yeah, but mine was more from a position of uh of luxury and curiosity like oh, i'm in a new place let's uh see mm. who I, you know what interesting people i can meet where she became willingly homeless so that's uh yeah yeah really interesting so. all right well we'll do an episode about couch surfing uh because <laughs> well i'm curious where where did that go so what happened uh yeah what happened there it still right? exists i still give them money every year oh yeah <laughs> Oh. Okay, we'll explore in another podcast. But, uh... <laughs> oh, I didn't know that. Okay. <laughs> All right, let's uh, listen to uh, Megan Davis. Yeah, enjoy. I think fundamentally I'm an explorer. So I'm interested in everything. Um, and it's often been hard for me to be like, I'm this and I'm only this and I'm only interested in this thing, you know? Um because my background has been pretty varied and the stuff that I'm interested in now and in the future is also 
you know, like where I see myself going is pretty varied. So, and I've, you know, was born in the US and I, I live in Australia now and I, I travel as much as I possibly can. It's hard getting off this island, I have to say. So that does sometimes cramp my plans. But yeah, fundamentally, I think I'm I'm an explorer and, um, you know, I'm interested in uncharted territories and what's next and what we can't see. I think like most explorers are, we're not interested in what's very tangible we're interested in the intangible or the thing that's around the corner or what might surprise us um we're interested in what we don't know as opposed to what we do know i think <laughs> maybe maybe think sorry when you said you were, were interested in what's around the corner i'm, I'm always that that my i annoy my family when we are traveling for instance and then we walk in it, like we're in a new town and I go and I go like come go back we'll 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 have an ice cream there's an and we're like yeah, but wait, I want to see what's around the corner just want to go this street yeah what would be here what would be there so that's your I, so I I just I'm like when I'm alone and I uh, I'm traveling I just I always I'm just I keep walking I go like, mm. what's what, what's here so literally <laughs> for me I take that uh, yeah anyway I, I um I wanted to ask you something about the the, the your varied background and future <laughs> <It's not laughs> interesting. How, what, how can you walk us through those so, uh yeah the many steps many the many steps. steps that have brought me here so when i when i was in uh, i guess elementary school and high school all i did was act and sing and you know i was very arty and that was pretty much what I spent most of my day doing. So I had, you know, my classes I had to take because I was college prep and you have to take this much science and this much math and, you know, all that stuff. But um, every chance I got, I was singing or acting and I could do that for two to three hours and get credits for it during the day. But then I also did it in the evening, you know, as part of extracurricular activities. And then I went to university and I started studying religion. So in, in the what I was studying was comparative religion. So it's so a sociological degree, not a not a theological degree. Right. And you look at you know different times and places and what people believed, and you look at the intersections of those beliefs, but also what's different. And you know you could compare anything from someone who lived in the Indus River Valley in India 3000 years ago to someone uh, who lives, you know, like a Protestant in, in upper New York state in the U S for example, and look at those belief systems to understand what's the same, what's different, what it means for culture, society, um, or how we see our worlds. And it's interesting as well, because that's where I really started first dissecting storytelling. So I, you know, mm -hmm. you could say the acting as well, yes, but for me that was a lot more about character development because the story I wasn't in control of the story. The story was written, and I was thrown into the story, and I had to, you know, make sense of it as as with my body and my expressions. And um, but the yeah, that um, dissecting of story and understanding what survives and what doesn't, what resonates and what doesn't, what continues to make sense and what starts losing relevance is you start you start seeing you know similarities and you start seeing things that are really strong and you start understanding what is catchy or what is how you remember things or um how they transform that's the most important thing so we we tend to think about culture as being quite static when in fact it's it moves at a rapid furious pace um, and the and you know it, it it continues right it runs and runs and runs and we think about ancient culture for example we think well it was the same you know there's like a thousand years and it was kind of the same not really right it was it it changed rapidly um, maybe not to the degree that we think of rapid now but for the, the time and place for them it did feel really fast so, so but, but but when did you start it you know when when was the moment that you kind of sort of if you um for lack of a better word, but when, when did you frame it as storytelling or story? When was that yeah. when you go like, huh, it's all about stories? Because, you know, if you, because it's very, you know, probably in hindsight, and when we're listening, 
to you. It's all clear. You're know, like, yeah, oh, you know, that's where you, where stories come from. Of course, of course. But when you're in the middle of it and you're studying uh, religious uh, or belief systems and, and religions and um, is there, when, when's the moment you go like, oh, actually that's the big kind of connect or was that part of, of what you were studying? Yeah. Um, Did they frame it as storytelling as well? Or, or was it? No. No, they mm-hmm. didn't. So, you know, there was story. So there was myth and mm-hmm. there was yeah, sure. folklore, right? So we talked about story and, and you know, Joseph Campbell, of course, comes mm-hmm. up over and over and over again. Um, but as it being a study of story, no, that was never, that was never explicit. And it wasn't until I, I actually dropped out of a master's degree because I decided I didn't want to be an academic. Um, and it wasn't until kind of 10 years after, after leaving that, that form of study that I started realizing that I could apply it to, um, well, at the time I was working as a designer, as a graphic designer, and I started thinking about, you know, how shape and form and all these things come together to create a story of some kind for people to interpret or interact with. But it was then that I started thinking about, you know, my background in in acting and my background in, you know, studying culture, which is fundamentally the study of stories, that I started understanding that I saw story in a different way than a lot of other people did because a lot of people would say, well, it's a story and it's a beginning, middle and an end. And I was like, well, but some don't. (laughs) And in fact, the more they don't end, the better they are because they transform or they're open-ended and you just run with it and think, well, what else can we do with this? Or what else could this possibly mean? How many times could I interpret the same Shakespearean sonnet, for example, right? The more that it's interpretable, the more that it's flexible, the more that we can incorporate it into something that's happening for us in a moment, the more likely that story is to survive. So I I realized a long way after, and there wasn't a moment that I can recall where I thought, you know, there was no like Newton's apple hits him on the head and like, oh, I just figured out a thing. You know, it it was more, it was very gradual where I started just through multiple conversations, just thought, wait a second, I see story, something very different and it was because of this study that I did. And when you talk, um, I'm from the United States as well, um, and also have an interest in how, uh, yeah, how religion shapes culture and, and culture, mm-hmm. shapes, everything is connected. But when you say that you studied then comparative religions, I'm telling, I'm, you know, trying to tell myself some story about you and your life and your upbringing. And my assumption mm-hmm. is, either came from a very religious background or a very liberal and open um open background and i'm curious mm-hmm. if that's uh if there's any if yeah. if the story that i'm telling myself has any truth to it or if i'm just you know uh, bad at telling myself <laughs> stories <laughs> yeah so kind of half half so my i think my my mom was kind of religious not overly but she was raised catholic and she really wanted me to be Catholic um, and took me to Sunday school. And, you know, I did the first communion and I was going through the confirmations um, process. Like, you know, so I was doing that study until I got into an argument with a nun and got kicked out of class. And then I just told my mom, I'm not going back. I was like, I'm done. That's it. I'm not going back. And she really tried to push me to go and I just wouldn't. And then my dad, when she told him, she said, you know, well, just wait till I tell your father. And I said, okay. So she tells him that I got into a fight with a nun and I wasn't going back to, you know, to catechism. He just said, did you really do that? And I said, yeah. And he was like, that's awesome. (laughs) Sorry. Can you tell me what the fight was about? (laughs) um okay sure so <laughs> my, yeah, you know, we, the story is not complete without that kind of mm-hmm. i'm just imagining you going <laughs> fist to fist with the nun right now yeah, yeah. And then yeah. Go, you... luckily didn't get physical so you know <laughs> um it wasn't that you know wasn't that uh terrible of a child but i, I you know i was 12 years old sitting in class and we we're talking about adam and eve and the garden of eden and so she was talking about how Eve ate from the, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. 
And then um, that causes a downfall of man. And so I, I was like, what? So I raised my hand. I was like, wait a second. I just have a question. You're the first person in history who says, what? Yeah. <laughs> like, I, I was definitely the only person in the class who found that, a, you know, a problem with the statement. So really? yeah. <laughs> like no one else was like, what's going no. on? Everyone's like, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> that yeah, explains, they're... that explains everything. <laughs> right. No, no, sorry. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, I was. If, well, they might have been thinking it, but they didn't say it. Right. Yeah, but I was yeah. the only person who who was just like, wait, wait a second. And so I said, um, so you're saying that women are the <laughs> fundamental problem with society, like we mm -hmm. cause the downfall of everything. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And she said, yes. And I was like, oh. <laughs> I was like, she right. Said okay. yes. She, <laughs> she said yes. She yes. said, yep. And uh, she said, it's in the Bible. And I said, uh, no, 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 no. I, I just said, no, I don't, I don't, I don't buy that. I, I don't think women are the cause of evil. And she Wait said, no. <laughs> yeah. and she, she started getting angry. And she oh, said, God. but that's what God and said. Proved, and proved wow. her point right there. <laughs> right. <laughs> Sorry. That's, not, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. I will show you. What, really? <laughs> she got angry with you and then. and then Yeah. Yeah. Uh, she, oh. I kept questioning her. So I can't remember the exact, you know, I don't remember exact level of, you know, how far this went. But I do know that, she, you know, she kept pushing back on me that this is in the Bible. This is what it says. And it was this very literal approach. And then I kept saying, <clears throat> no, that doesn't actually explain the, the you know, concept of evil. It doesn't explain why bad things happen in the world. And it certainly can't be the fault of one gender or, <laughs> you know. It's it's just impossible. There's no way that this is a valid story and it doesn't prove anything. And I and I was just like, no, I don't accept it. So she kicked me out of the room and I had to go sit in the hallway. And she said, you know, I'll call your mother. I'm going to tell her what happened. I was like, okay. So, you know, I wasn't really that worried about it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so yeah, so that's wow. that's how that's that story, that that's how that story went. And so then I, I just I never went back. After that point, mm. <laughs> particularly interested in any of anything that had to do with any of that. So, yeah, but yeah, I think my there was a lot of religious upbringing, I guess, and lots of talk about relig religion and like my grandma, my dad's mother lived across the road. We lived on a farm together. So it was a family farm. So we all lived on the farm. She lived across the road and she had a lot of very pointed ideas about about religion and um I didn't necessarily agree with her either. So I I I don't really know where my very independent stance came amongst all of that, but it just, yeah, I always kind of had my own mind and my own way of thinking or definitely my own way of questioning things. And I think I was surprised that she reacted the way she did because I thought I was having, you know, like a discussion. I thought I was able to question things i thought that was allowed but no apparently it's not <laughs> i've been on the other side of uh of big religious questions as well and uh yeah <laughs> <laughs> i uh i like that your dad supported you <laughs> yeah <laughs> in like a very offhand yeah like he, he kind of closed the subject he didn't really ever talk about it again you yeah. know but he really left it to me to fight my my battle on my own, but he just said, Ripping "Yeah, cool. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly, exactly." Yeah. Fighting the yeah. nuns. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, that's so. Amazing. Then what? Uh, well, yeah. yeah, I was going to ask. Then what? Then what drove you to study comparative religion? Because um, it's a very niche. Well, I'm thinking yeah. well, of myself coming out of high school, right? Um, and it's a very. It seems like a very niche study. Uh, yeah. Don't, well, and after fighting the nuns, yeah, I mean, you you go like, let's not go. <laughs> or were you? Or was that actually? Was that? Did you? I mean, did that have any connection or with that experience? Or or, or yeah, 
I mean, prob yes, it did, but it wasn't a drive. Yeah, it wasn't a driver. Like that, that was definitely a very foundational moment in my life mm. that, you know, drew some lines for me mm. in terms of who I am and, and what I think about various things. But um, I think that what there was this course that I did when I was in high school. So we could sign up for advanced studies if we could find a teacher would teach us. And so I signed up for advanced American lit and it was one-on-one. -on -one. No one else wanted to do the class. I just, it was just me. And a lot of the stuff we read was written in the 60s, 70s and some into the 80s. But that was a time when in American literature, it was heavily spiritual, right? So we were reading like Ken Kesey and um, Jonathan Livingston Seagull. And I can't remember the author, but you know, these are highly spiritual books. And a lot of them had, you know, kind of Christian and Buddhist and, you know, like all these different religious kind of without adhering to one in particular, but it had all these various belief systems kind of underpinning the, the philosophies that were coming through right? Um, or refuting it. Like, you know, Kesey definitely was his own. He wasn't particularly adhering to anything, but he also had pretty strong philosophies that were definitely underpinned by major, you know, religious belief systems. So it was a lot of discussion about religion. And so then I started thinking about um, culture, right? So these stories were foundational in these, this, this transformation period of the, of the 50s into, I guess, what's considered, you know, the very modern modern age of you know what we think of like the american novel right so things from like the 80s onwards there was a very different different kind of shift but there was that massive transition in those 30 years after the war the way that writing shifted in america so i was looking at these stories and then i took a, a an elective that everyone had to have some sort of elective in the humanities and i chose a religion class and i I think it was World Religion 101. And so we were talking about all these different religions from all over the world. And we were talking a lot about Joseph Campbell and, you know, these kind of, you know, voices that we're constantly hearing about culture and religion. And I got really fascinated by it. So I started talking to the professors who taught it. And I was like, what do you guys do? Like, what's your job? Like, how do you teach this stuff? How do you study this stuff? And then the more involved I got, the more I realized that I was fascinated with it. I didn't know what I wanted to do with it. So at first it was like a minor, but then once I got into the programs, they kept pushing me to do a major. So, and then they were pushing me to do my master's. And I, I think, you know, it was one of those things where they thought, oh, here's a really great addition to the department. This We like the way this person thinks, or they're, you know, they agree with what we teach or our, our standpoint on these things, whatever it is. But um, but then I was just like, no, I want to be an artist. And I, I dropped my master. Okay. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Which I didn't become, by the way, but that was the thinking. <laughs> so what was the, tell, tell us more about that thinking of, I want to be an artist. Because that's yeah. a really, I think that's an interesting um, question or or thought that, I mean, I think also Morgan and I had, uh, you know, many times I want to be an artist. I still do, by the way. Um, it's still a thing. Yeah. What, what sparked that thought, and and what 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 was that in your in your mind? What what kind of artist? What what was that about? Yeah. So I was fascinated by photography. I loved photography. I was taking little courses, you know, like at the the community college. So not the one that not at the university state level university I was at, but there was community college, which you could do. And um, I was shooting for myself and, and I was like, this is, there's something about this form that I really love. And I like the way that I could structure worlds and make, make stories basically, mm -hmm. because I, I wasn't one that I wasn't like a straight photographer. I didn't like candid shots. I liked setting up shots and I liked, creating worlds and I liked you know lighting them in studios so um so it was very much like a you know I mean a lot of them had kind of fairy tale aspects to them they involved fairy tale characters dressing people up or making 
making little mannequin kind of things that I could pose um, and backdrops that I drew. So it was, but it was the, the, the medium that I was using to, to capture the stories was, but was a, was a camera. Um, and so, yeah, I really, I really loved it. Um, and so I thought, you know, there's all these things I'm studying and I'm really fascinated with it. And I started kind of trying to produce these stories, these like this folklore or this myth or these stories about culture and these images. And I thought, okay, I love this. This is what I love. Like, I'm not an academic. I don't want to sit and watch people and think about stuff and write stuff and like look, dig through ancient Sanskrit and try to learn that language or ancient Greek or, you know, all these dead kind of languages. Like I, I, I want my hands dirty. I want to be amongst people. I want to make things I want to create. And that, that really, that really inspired me. Um, and then I was thinking, but I also want something that's really practical. So maybe I'll become a designer. Maybe I'll become a graphic designer. So what, did, what ended up happening is I've met, um, so my ex is Australian. That's why I moved here. We're not together anymore, but I came here to be with him. And then I studied photography at RMIT here. Through that process of studying photography, I started shooting a little bit, but then design work kept coming up at the same time. So it's like, we need you, we need people to shoot these shoes and then lay them out, right? So then I started transitioning into magazine layout and I was doing photo retouching and calibrating machines, so machines printed because the, all that technology, it runs the same way. Calibrating a screen is the same as calibrating printers and and this is a while ago, so I know the technology is very different. But back then, there was quite a bit of manual mm -hmm. kind of tinkering. Um, I started doing that. And then um, this is really funny. I quit my job and became homeless and was traveling the world because, again, I wanted to become an artist. <laughs> so, so it all came full circle. Sorry, so, go back go back a bit. You became homeless? Sorry. Yeah, <laughs> I chose to become homeless. You so chose to like, become homeless? Tell me. Yeah. <laughs> So I became houseless in terms of, you know, I always had a home to sleep in. It just wasn't mine. And mm. so I uh, I had a job and I I just I quit and I went back to the U.S. and just to see my family. And then I journeyed on to Europe and I have family that was living there at the time and friends there. And I was traveling around there and I came back to Australia. And when I came back here, I, I really didn't have anywhere to go. So I had a friend renovating her apartment and I just was like hey uh can I live with you and help you renovate and then you know when you're ready I can I'll find somewhere else to go and so she was like sure so I helped her like smashed out her kitchen and her, her bathroom and everything and um during that time I had this blog I called the bed blog and the bed blog was I took a photo of the bed I slept in that night and posted it on this blog oh. and the blog was connected to Twitter and Facebook this was 11 years ago Oh, oh, almost 12, when it was a very different platform. Anyone could pretty much see anything you posted. Yeah. And so people were following along and commenting like, don't give up, keep going. And, oh, do you need somewhere to stay? You can house sit for me. Or do you need a job? I need someone to design a poster or I need someone to do yard work. Or um, do you want to come over and have dinner? You know, do you need something to eat? So everything I needed came to me. And then um, in the meantime, I was building an art practice and I had gallery openings and I was sitting galleries and had work up on the wall. And it was still photography and it was just still these worlds I was creating. But it was getting to the point where I was like, OK, I'm going to get kicked out of the last place I'm in. <laughs> they want me to go. I really want to move in somewhere else like and have and pay rent and, you know, live like kind of a more normal life because it was it, it's very exhausting living that way. And it was almost a year. So I was nerves were frayed and you know my gallery show was ending and my place where I was staying was ending and so I reached out to a person I used to work for and said hey um, I've learned all this stuff about um, telling stories online like social media which you know Facebook's really new um, do you do you guys want anything like that where you're you know where you at this business do you think you need help with like communicating online and he said yes um, so then I started uh, he was my first client, basically, with the business that I have now. And so I learned everything by trying to become an artist and telling stories online. And then I accidentally started a business, which mm -hmm. I am doing now, almost 12 years later. So 
It's like the uh, hero's journey. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In a, in a way, a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> A little bit, or um, like uh, Kurt Vonnegut's, uh, I, I don't know if you've seen his video online, Man in Hole, he calls that. Yeah, <laughs> I know? love Vonnegut, yes. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Well, um, it is it is actually interesting because, um, and if you, if you know, listening to you, um, that especially, I mean, obviously the fight with the nun is like this iconic moment in your yeah. the movie of your life. Which I yeah. actually am, I'm seeing now in my head, like this is <laughs> like that's such a great scene, right? Uh, but it is so. But it's but but if I if I think about it, you know, your kind of um, your challenging, you know, both of both kind of saying no stories are it's not. It's not about because you. Do, so basically, what you said to the nun is like you don't understand the story. That's mm. not what the story is about. That's not what story is. And mm. on the other hand, is like, and it's about questions. You know, it's about asking questions. And uh, mm. and so that is, I think that stayed with you all the time, asking questions. And so it's it's not only stories. It's also, it is about asking questions and uncovering. And that this is where you, you know, when you started saying, you, you know, you're an explorer. Mm. Right? So it's exploring. But in, in a lot of, so I kind of, I think that's what you're saying, right? right? When you say you see stories different, because if I think about it, for a lot of people, stories are just stories. And, mm. you know, it's nice. It's, uh, it, it might be, uh, you know, might be some information in it and it might be, well, it's entertaining, uh, but it's not about questions. That's mm. for a lot of people, that's, that's actually not what it's about. Stories are about answers. Yeah, you know, it's more about like, no. This is the story. It's not it shouldn't lead to questions, but it might also be a difference between sort of you know. Again, I haven't studied storytelling that much, but uh, there is a difference between cultures, right? So, I mean, Eastern cultures uh, have more open ended stories, or Asian sto stories will have st endings where you have to figure it out yourself. Like these are the elements, and you know, you now you tell the story in your head how it <laughs> might end. And yeah. whereas in Western cultures, there is a end to it, like, and usually a happy end, unless it's Scandinavian, because then it's all doom and gloom and terrible <laughs> and everybody dies, but, or is, or at least everyone, it ha it happens, or they are like, you know, de depressed or something, something really bad and dark happens. But especially, <laughs> obviously, the, you know, the Hollywood storytelling, but a lot of the Western storytelling is about happy ends, right? Yeah, definitely. Yes. But there's a difference between these different cultures. So has that influenced you as well when you started, you know, studying kind of these different cultures and different ways of uh, stories? Is that did that influence you? Yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah, like I, um, as soon as when I teach storytelling, I I go in and say we, you know, in the West we have a tradition of a story being a straight line or you know a line that goes up to like some sort of peak and then it curves down again. And then I tell them, let's just forget about that. We're not doing that today. And then I also specifically do not teach the hero's journey because mm -hmm. it, there's a lot of problems with that framework in terms of it is a one Western white man's view of mm -hmm. stories from all over the world. It's like, oh, it just fits this. And it's like, well, do, do they? Does it? No. You know, in, in Joseph Campbell. You know, I had to really kill a few darlings when I really had to start dissecting that and say, okay, yeah, I'm I'm not going to teach that and I'm not going to talk about it. And if I do, it's with a lot of caveats um, because there's a lot of problematic thinking that goes into that framework. Um, but yes, definitely like stories. I, I talk about storytelling as a, a cycle and, and they always move in circles. And everything moves in circles, like life is, is cycles and, and nature is cycles. And, um, you know, some of the most natural shapes are circles, you know, where we find repeated over and over again. And so stories for me are a circle and they always begin and end in the same place. So, you know, if you have a main protagonist, a story that's being told through a particular point of view, that person is still the same person. They've just had a bunch of experiences that's changed them in some way so it's changed their maybe where they live or their position in society or maybe they're you know they go from being single to being married or you know if it's like a love story 
but they're still them, right? And that, but it's just something about their point of view has changed. And it's that journey that you go on with them that teaches you something or you experience something with them. So for me, stories are a cycle, a circular experience. And they also, you know, most stories tell you in the very beginning what it's about, but it's not until you come back to the end, which is also usually still the beginning, that that meaning changes for you. So the, my favorite way of explaining this is the Wizard of Oz. And because I talk to people all over the world, I've had to find a thing. What what is every what has everyone heard of? And surprisingly, the Wizard of Oz is very, it's, you, know, you can kind of be in a room and say, who here has heard of this movie, The Wizard of Oz? You know, 90% of the people there will, will raise their hand. It's really interesting. But Dorothy wakes up one morning and says, there's no place like home. It's so boring. I want to go somewhere else, somewhere over the rainbow. So she's talking about home, home, home. I hate it. Sick of it. Blah. It's black and white. It's so dull. So she's talking about home. And there's no place like home in a really negative way. Then she gets whisked away to the land of Oz. And the moment she lands, she says, I have to go home. How do I get home? And they say, follow the yellow brick road to the Emerald City. And, um, you know, the, the great and powerful wizard of Oz will tell you. He'll tell you how to get home. He knows everything. And she's like, great. And then she goes this, on this journey and she meets all these people. She learns all these things about herself and about what she wants from life. She gets to the wizard and she says, I want to go home. And he's like, look, I'm not really a wizard. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. You know, and she's like, what? And she's like, well, how do I get home? And he said, you know, you've always known how to go home. The power has always been with you. And then the good, good witch comes in and says, you just click your heels together three times and say, there's no place. Like home. And then she goes home. So she's right back where she started. But her perception of home changes. So it's in color. And she looks around and she sees everything that she has there. And it's actually just as magical as Oz. Right. But she's changed on that journey. And in fact, you know, the reality is she's been in like a, a coma or something or I'm not. They don't really say what happens to her, but she's unconscious for an extended period of time and she wakes up again. So she's actually never even left. But that's that's the way stories really for me work mm -hmm. is that it's this exploration of a, of some moment that's picked out. And then this character goes on a journey exploring that moment and they're going all over the place but then they revisit that same point in time or thinking or emotional question whatever it is and they re and then they go oh and they have this epiphany and then you're like oh <laughs> amazing and then you have that journey with them and you learn something new about yourself and about the world and about this character but you've never left you know yeah. you're still sitting there in front of the screen watching the tv nothing's changed for you <laughs> except your point of view or what you know or don't know at that time well and yeah it's i think that's really 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 cool i because you are also cuz the main character might you know she might be dorothy might be back in the same place you know home but mm. it's a for her it's a different place yes because, right so so everything actually changed uh, but nothing changed but their yes. perception just yeah in her mind it changed um yeah, there's a um there's a uh a little piece of a poem in Amsterdam underneath the bridge if you if you so Morgan if you go to the train station in Amsterdam there's sort of you can go underneath this road next to a canal anyway there's a yeah I know. Of a, yeah so it says I, I can't translate it exactly but it says um stay um uh, staying is not the same as returning um and um it means so it was actually in a place where people would go off with with their ships and and you know <laughs> conquer places and kill people and stuff and steal their whatever gold that's basically where, in Amsterdam that's how we build Amsterdam sorry that's a different story but uh, this idea of <laughs> you travel so these are the travelers that go and the idea that you stay either, so you have, a, you know, there's two people, uh, brothers, sisters, uh, one stays, one one leaves and travels the world, comes back. Uh, they don't live in the same place anymore. 
because mm-hmm. they, you know, traveling will, you know, change, you know, the way you view where you came from. So literally it's what mm-hmm. happens. Uh, um, the, uh, a friend of mine, uh, Union, you know, mm-hmm. uh, her son uh, is on a ship now, uh, sort of um, basically it's like it's the, 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 um, there's teachers and there's the whole school who comes with them, but they're on they're on this boat, this ship, and they they've sailed across the Atlantic Ocean and for months, um, you know. And he, he's, he's he's studying math at the same time, which is amazing to me. <laughs> like, how can you? But still, but so you know, I asked her. So you know, when he comes back, he's going to be a different kid, right? Yeah. So it's different. So it's in a way a lot of the so it really. So Wizard of Oz and like a lot of these stories, they do reflect things that we go through, right? So, so in that sense, these stories are, we're I mean, not sure if they're metaphors, but they, a lot of them are metaphors, but they are about life. So that's, I think, why they also resonate. So, uh, mm. and, and maybe even more than stories that are, you know, in, in that sense, not circular, because they might need be entertaining, but they don't really kind of resonate so i'm not sure if that's true if stories like that stay with us longer or not but to me it's so it's really cool to be able to um see sort of stories in your life as well you know that as stories if you know what i mean so if not talking about like oh yeah that happened because like no there's a there there these are all kind of stories you changed you know something happened to you and then and and this is why I was really interested in, in like things like origin stories. Like so, so if I if I if I coach people, for instance, I always want to hear their origin story. And lots of times people go like, ah, yeah, right. My parent. Oh, this is why I do this now. And I think it also might, you know, it's also about reflecting on where you come from. I mean, when you're younger, you might not be able to. When you're you know as a teenager. <laughs> You know, you might, you know, might not be able to. I don't know. Maybe that happens in your twenties or thirties or something that you get easier for for years to reflect on where you're from and your parents. But but it is such a um, I don't know if you if you understand your origin story, you understand more about yourself, and it is all about that journey in the sense you know the which you just described. That's what you know. Somewhere we all go through these kind of uh, we all go down the rabbit hole, right? Mm-hmm. So again, referenced another story uh, which is the same right uh, so right so i think that they're saying that so it's not just about storytelling but it's so because if you talk about storytelling it sounds for a lot of people it's like oh that's really nice that's uh, such a uh separate thing from life but actually no it's but it's not it's you are actually it's right there it's it's you and I it think, and I actually, and I'm looking, so I have to tell you, and I actually, cause I, I have a screen here and I have your LinkedIn page up and it's yeah. become a story. So I'm like, uh, so like, that's, that's right. So you, you, you become a story because you are, you become aware of the fact that you are a story. You are yeah. the story. Yes. Yeah. And I mean, it, cause you are only a collection of your stories. A eulogy isn't a list of statistics, a eulogy. <laughs> That'd be cool, by the way. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it would be, it'd be interesting. Yeah. 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 The spreadsheet sheet of your life. <laughs> yeah, it's like a bunch, all the critical stats. Um, but, you know, there, there's, there are stats in there, right? You know, like maybe how long you've lived or where you've lived or if you've got children or a spouse or something like that. But um it's the stats are conveyed through a story through the context the contextualization of a story um and it'll have you know like your points of view or what you believed in or what you causes you were engaged in and what impact you left on the world it's that that's your story it's your legacy so um and your you know your all cultures have their stories and that's what keeps them a unique culture and not just at a you know, national level, for example, you know, we all have origin stories about how did, you know, how did you meet your, your spouse or your partner or whoever you're, you know, dating at the moment, people love those stories, you know, how did you meet, you know, and that's, that's like part of your culture as a couple. And you have like your unique language or your in jokes. And sometimes you forget and you say like their pet name in front of other people. And they're like, (laughs) Mm -hmm. call me that. (laughs) 
other people, you know, but it's like those, all those aspects, those little stories, the, the, the name on its own doesn't make any sense to anyone, but you, but if they hear the story, it might. Right. So it's stories are what create culture from, and, and culture happens regardless. Right. And uh, it's either, it's an unconscious thing, but if you want to become conscious about it, you become aware of the stories and you start telling the right ones to move with culture in the right way. And we see this played out, especially in the political arena, you know, um, but, you know, but like if we're talking about organizational culture, for example, you know, we're doing like strategic narratives that is about putting forward what are the stories that exemplify the culture and the vision that we want to bring into being. Right. So that's that intentionality. And it's um, and I can't like I just had the, the Newtonian light bulb moment um, because I oh. did. So I'm really, I'm really interested and fascinated about death and end of life and yeah. how we approach that as a, as a species, as a culture, as people. And it, cause it's one of the great universal connectors. It's something mm. no matter how, what century you were born in or where you were born, it's something we all have to deal with. And it's um, quite an experience. And so I did a lot of research ab- around uh, memorialization and how we memorialize and how we remember those that we've, that we've loved and that we've lost. And I found I found one thing is, of course, people are very uncomfortable about to speak about it in in Western uh, societies. As, and I was specifically looking at the United States and people don't want to talk about it. It's the, it becomes this heavy thing. They don't want to remind people that they're grieving. The 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 outsiders don't want to directly ask about it because they don't want to bring up perhaps a painful topic. And so there becomes this kind of like elephant in the room. And and I found, okay, what is the one thing that they really want or need to memorialize even better? And the thing is to share stories. So it's not always just recognizing, oh, I'm so sorry for your loss, but oh, what was one of your favorite memories? Or, oh, do you have a favorite story with this person? And when you can create that space for stories, it just completely transformed and changed um, because people were excited to listen to a nice story. People were so pleased and loved sharing this story about someone that they love. Mm. And it really became this magical moment in space to connect with each other as well. And I didn't, of course, I thought it was this great insight about, you know, memorialization and end of life, but, but then you're also talking about the story thread of it, which reminded me of this. And and I think it's also such a powerful tool for connection. Of course, political dynasties use this as well, but I think it's that's one of the really beautiful things about stories is connection. And I just had that light bulb moment. So thank you. Yeah. Well, <laughs> glad I could glad I could help <laughs> unintentionally, but yeah. 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 It's yeah, it's it's fascinating once you become conscious, right? Of you know, well, how did stories work in that context? Or what did this, that story do? Or, you know, um, I mean, I have like a suite of intentional stories that I tell because I, I know that I tell this story because I want to convey this piece of information or create this level of understanding or create this type of con- of connection with someone. Um, so once you have that kind of awareness, it never goes away, right? Um, and w- when I talk about story, when I when I do story training, I always use the term story thinking because I teach people to think about storytelling. I won't teach you how to tell the perfect story because that's impossible. It doesn't it doesn't happen. Story is a lifelong learning pursuit. You know, there's no like famous director who's like, well, I've won one Oscar and I'm not going to direct any other films. I've done it all. I've learned everything and I've told the, t- the perfect story. You know, it doesn't work that way. Um, so it's, yeah, it's this, it's this awareness. And once you have like your story vision on what you can see and understand and start playing with is, it just opens so many doors for you. There's no limits. I like story thinking. Mm. <laughs> I, it, I, so uh, I do ha- have a thought about, you know, something you said earlier um, uh, that might be related to this. Um, you said, you know, the writing, you know, in, 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 in you know, you th- see through history, writing changes, right? Uh, you know, you talked about the 60s and the 70s um, and then, you know, the, the, you know, the writing changes. But is I, I just, I was thinking, does the writing change or does sort of because in my mind there's always so many people who write 
but only a few are, will emerge because they are accepted by publishers or by the readers, et cetera, et cetera. So it's also about the stories we like to listen to or we, so it's, you know, you know what I'm saying? Is that, is it, yeah. is it, it's like, you know, the people who emerge are not the only people who write. Right. Mm. So there's lots of people who, you know, who, who might read, write amazing, you know, in the seventies, probably there must be a million stories you've never heard of and that are amazing, but they were never published like musicians, right? There's like, there's a musician on the corner of the street and he's like this amazing musician, <laughs> but you know, they'll never make it because of, you know, whatever reason, culture or, you know, we don't, we, that's just not the, the, thing that we publish right now or stuff like that so is there also i mean is how is that how would that work for you i mean because the culture is you know it kind of it's all these things added together mm -hmm. and then it also accepts certain stories like you know we we find it difficult to accept stories with an open end because or you know because we we don't we don't like that because it leaves us like yeah but i want to know what happened you know, okay. so, you know, at my home, when we watch a movie that has an open ending and nothing, there's no conclusion, <laughs> we are like, is this a series? Is there like a part two? <laughs> like, <laughs> that leaves me, I don't, that's, I, it doesn't satisfy. Yeah. Right? And we want that because we live in a world, in the, at least in the West, where we want to be satisfied. We want to go, oh, yes, you know, I want to have my yeah. desserts as well. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> You know, but when it's not, you're like, hmm. And we don't like that because it's no. a part, because we don't, we haven't, in, in a way, it's way more interesting to leave people like that. Uh, mm. It's way more interesting because it then, but you don't know, you don't have the ability or you don't understand, you don't have, nobody taught you that that is, yeah. that's the fun part of the story where it leaves you <laughs> and you go like, hmm. Yeah. What, that what happened? So, yeah. Does that make any sense? Yeah. Yeah. No, it does. Yeah. I I think my response is just write or record or do whatever it is you need to do to get the story into the world because we're constantly finding genius that wasn't recognized at its time because it was too far ahead or sometimes maybe it was too far in the but past. That's too late. That's too, like Van Gogh, for instance. Like people like that, they're like, that's too late. That's like now, now you like, now you like the art. Now yeah, it's like yeah. now we discover, you know, but it's true. Obviously, you're right. I mean, sure. I mean, there, you know, there's people, you know, way before their time. I mean, we discover new scientists, new people who are actually were fundamental to something. You're know, like, did you know actually that person was the one? And we're like, oh. But that's yeah. how many years ago. They're gone. They, now they don't get that recognition. Or maybe that's also part of our culture that we feel like we need the recognition now. Yes. It's just part of our, we know well, we want to be satisfied now. So and not yeah. like, we don't want to have this feeling that we actually did something that has impact and will be recognized later. That's not good enough. Maybe, but then maybe that's also our short-term kind of the way we're brought up and taught. Like we need, we need our success now. That's a hundred percent. Yeah, it's a hundred percent cultural for sure. In, in mm. terms of, uh, I did this. I said that, yeah. and I want recognition. Yeah, hundred percent. Um, but I think in particular when we're talking about representation in terms of diversity, diverse voices, that there's a lot of problematic thinking that have excluded people in the past. So you know, finding out about uh women women writers women poets women artists hmm. uh across in, in any culture it doesn't matter what culture we're talking about but um women are constantly being discovered and some of them were really really popular and in fact massive voices at their time but they were hmm. disappeared after the hmm. fact because they didn't fit into like a white western male canon for example yeah um so they were were popular and were recognized at their time and they were just you know forgotten and and the world moved on but now the but because they did write because they were there because they did they are you know documented they existed and their work still exists in some way mm -hmm. 
they're back. Um, and, you know, it's hard to think about the people who, especially like women who contributed a lot to science that were never recognized and are start and are starting to be now. It's um, still happening. It's still it's happening. Still, I mean, I just is. read, I just read this thing on, on LinkedIn uh, that start, said, uh, you know, listed the women that are, were actually responsible for the whole emergence of, of AI, of all the, mm. you know, the, you know, the women that actually were, you know, the, the, and not the, you know, the Elon Musk's, yes. of, you know, the guy, the, you know, those guys that, that kind of always take the limelight, where actually there are also all these, these women that are actually fundamental to, to all these developments. And uh, we still need, although it's you know, really current, but still we need to kind of be, you know, made aware of it. Like, you know, so that's also, that's also, it's still the, you know, you're still fighting the nun in that sense. For sure. Yeah. For sure. Isn't that yeah. Weird? But even, even if you feel like you don't have a voice, don't allow yourself to become voiceless. Still yeah. right. Still seeing still produce um because that the fact that you're doing it is is the most important thing because then because you're not silenced you're still you still have a voice and like i just can't encourage that enough and not just not just for women or or voices that are marginalized for anyone i'm talking about any any person who has something inside them produce it because you never know because if i when i talk about storytelling and, I, and and especially in the innovation context. So like with design teams, I always stress this over and over again. It's we, not me. It's we, not me. You, your story is one of an infinite amount in terms of the amount of people that have lived on this planet and the people that will potentially come after. So, but you're contributing to a bigger landscape and while you might think, well, who would care about my story? You don't know. And that's part of the mystery. Because someone does always care about your story because your friend calls you up and says, how are you doing? They want to hear what stories you have, what's going on in your life. And you, don't, you just don't know what one story can do. You don't understand the kind of tsunami-like power it can have as it, or a snowball, like becoming an avalanche. You don't know until you put it out there. But I think a lot of people are um, get discouraged because they don't feel like, A, that anyone would care, but also some people are discouraged because they actually have a battle to fight to be heard. And that's really hard, you know, and I can't. Um, and while I do understand, there's also battles that I understand that I will never, I won't understand. And I, and I don't understand how scary or painful or even dangerous it can be for some people to actually tell their story. But mm. You know, that for me, that's like if that's what you have to do to as like an ultimate act of rebellion, then then do it <laughs> because you just don't know. <laughs> and are you because I'm also thinking you you talked about you wanted to be an artist. So you also have thought spent time thinking about the art of creation and, and making things and bringing them to life. What is it like when you have a story like are you inside of you and you don't do something with it? like? Mm -hmm. Or, or are you so now comfortable telling stories that you're like, oh, okay, here's something here. Let me create that mm. space to flourish. Yeah. Um, so I guess maybe I'll kind of, it's like a, an adjacent question. <laughs> it's like the politicians answer the question you wish, you wish you'd been asked <laughs> and you have been asked, but I'll, I promise it'll, it'll, it'll come together. So um <laughs> At the, beginning, at the end of last year, I decided that I was going to start acting again. Um, and so I auditioned, I've auditioned exactly twice and I've been cast exactly two times. So that is very high success rate. Like that is not normal. That doesn't happen. So I've just taken it as a good sign that I'm supposed to start acting again because I got cast twice and I auditioned twice. So um and you know, for for whatever reason, it was just real, it felt really like even though I'd spent so much time doing it, it felt really hard to be like, to give myself permission to do it again. And I was just like, no, I'm going to do it. This is what I want to do. Um, and it's something that I don't know where it's going to go. And I have no idea where it will take me, but I feel like this is somehow the next step in, in, in my life or like where I'm supposed to evolve to. And so, and, and like acting is like, I was talking about, you know, 
comparative religion acting is incredibly foundational for what I do. And I've, I've now like got, I actually teach acting to like designers, you know, like how do we act, you know, how do we actually act through personas or, or roles? Like, you know, here's some actual skills that actors use, you know, um, because I've seen with what I do that that's what I was doing anyways. So now I've like learned, okay, you know, but then there's this other side of me that it's like, I have to take this all deeper because there's, it's like any kind of storytelling or creativity there's no end you just go deeper and deeper and deeper until you know you die basically <laughs> you don't stop becoming you're not like now I'm an actor and I've retired you don't no. you're an actor and then you die <laughs> so because it, it's like a calling it's not a job so um yeah so in terms of you know storytelling and and getting those stories out of you I think the biggest question people have to ask is wh what in what way does the story need to come out? And like Arnie was saying, uh, I am not a writer, writer, writing anything I can do to not write. Perfect. Great. You know, uh, uh, so I've got a podcast. And so that's where you're learning. You know, this is where I add value. But this is also where I get the story out of me. And And Morgan, you're here because you obviously love stories and you love having conversations and asking deep questions and you get to do that. And so that's why you're here to get those stories, you know, out of the other person, but also out of yourself, right? Because you were having connection moments while we we're talking about, Oh yeah, that I thought of this. And I thought about, you know, these, these conversations around death and memorialization. Um, so yeah, don't, it's, it's anything you do is the, the thing to do. And you'll know because you really want to do it, you know, don't write a book if you really don't want to write a book. I mean, writing books are horrible. I knew I... it. I knew it. <laughs> but it's a, it's a grueling thing, writing. It really <laughs> is, you know? Like, you can understand why there was a lot of writers that had substance abuse problems. I completely understand because the writing is <laughs> really hard and it's awful. A lot of it is awful. And, um, you know, I, I don't like writing. I don't like the act of writing. I like having written. I like reading what I've written after it's done. <laughs> oh, yeah. But, the act of doing it, I'm just like, oh, this is so hard. <laughs> but isn't that part of being so? In a way, so I, you know, I, I actually do see myself as a, as a, as an artist. And I, Morgan and I talked about this uh, uh, a lot actually. About if you say I'm an artist, do you? Yeah. There's this weird thing where you go like, I don't deserve to say that because you know that sounds very as if it's a lofty thing, which is not because most artists are poor and. Are starving <laughs> you know it's not a, but it's like this you know you, you have to earn that in some weird way uh but but uh, but art to me um and I, I you know i grew up in a family with artists and uh but i um to me art is part of that is also suffering that sounds it might be maybe a big word for it but but there is a suffering to it because um uh, so if i paint for as i paint if I paint, um, it's terrible. It's the same. I have dyslexia. So writing, I, that makes sense to me that it's hard for me to write because of my dyslexia, but painting I can actually do, but I find it really terrible. Um, because I, I, I feel like I'm failing all the time. I don't know what I'm doing. It's like horrible and it doesn't work. And it's like, no, it <laughs> But, you know, and then when it's done, I'm I'm kind of happy, but then it's, I, I can do better. So there's this mm. continuous kind of, I don't know, I, it's it's not a, to me, it's not like a positive thing at all. It's not like, yay, I'm painting, yay. But I need to, I need to create. So it's not just with painting. I need to create. I just need to create something. Whether it's, I play music, I've done, I've been on stage, I've done, I've done uh, comedy, actually. And whatever it is, I don't care. It's all to me. It's all the same. As long as I create in my business, it's the same thing. I need to create something, and and mm -hmm. and, and so I don't, I don't think I've ever. I mean, it's only the last few years that I kind of frame it as stories, um, but it is sort of stories that, to me. Um, so when you talk about acting, for instance, to me, acting is, it's just you know how you go through life it's like i have these different personas they go like <laughs> yeah. now i'm a painter <laughs> now i'm a photographer my first job was photographer so now yeah. I'm, now i'm a photographer right and that's i ever even have different jackets <laughs> which my wife's like you're crazy <laughs> 
I, I, I kind of like, yeah, because I would need to kind of put myself in the in the role. In the role. Of, you know, yeah. yeah. I have special glasses for when I focus. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you have focus. That <laughs> help. But is that something you recognize? Because that I think for, for a lot of people, that's sort of how you step into a mm. kind of a, a role and or give yourself permission. Because I heard you said, give, you know, giving yourself permission. Yeah. To me, I... It is also about giving me myself permission to be that, right? You know, now, yeah. I'm, now, I'm, now I'm, I am, come on, you can, you know, and I'm a guy, so I buy gear, first of all, sure. right? So, <laughs> so I yeah. buy, you know, 20 cameras and lenses and stuff and stuff. So I, yeah. to, I don't know what that is, but it's a male, I think it's, <laughs> I don't know, it's only a male thing, but I think it's a male thing to kind of, you know, it's insecurity and it's like, you know, yeah. it's like, you know, first you hide yourself behind. No, I, I need to write. <laughs> yeah. I need to write stuff. Otherwise I can't do it. <laughs> right. Um, but it is sort of, uh, I don't know, the, if you frame these things as, as uh, in, in the sense of storytelling and, mm. and like you said, in circular stories, mm. it, it, then it's not like, then also you go back and you go, nothing's, nothing's ever lost. Right, because mm. I, 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 nothing's ever a waste of time. There's never been yeah. sort of like a, oh, you know, I it, because it's it because it's circular, not a straight line. And if we think yeah. of straight lines, we get you know we feel like we've lost things. We've lost, you know, I should have done these things, and I've wasted all my time trying to be a photographer, and now yeah. I, I wanted to be podcast host. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, because yeah, what you're you know what you're saying is uh, is there you take on board everything right it's your your stories everything you ever do whether even if it's like you know your explorer kind of uh, you know yeah every corner everything you've learned every 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 different thing you've done uh, in the end you use all of that but you but i think a lot of people are not aware of that they're not aware of the fact that they They've they've studied something completely different, and then they went and they had this experience there, and they had this odd job there, and then they are not aware because they don't look back and see them as sort of circular stories, where then they actually take all that with them, and then yes. that has built their. So I think to me that's such a powerful way of looking at story, your stories, your yeah. origin stories. Yeah, it definitely, well, for example, I have a friend who studied the Internet of Things and he has a master's in the Internet of Things. What he does now is builds communities. And I said, and he's like, you know, it, it, I wasted all this time like studying and getting, I actually know he's got a doctorate. He's got a doctorate in it. So he's like saying he wasted all this time. And I said, no, because you're talking, you just studied how machines can talk to one another but in fact what you've got now is you're just getting humans to talk to each other mm-hmm. but probably a lot of the underlying principles are the same like building connections between yeah. random things and people so that things happen so that you're working together towards a greater purpose yeah, and so it all completely makes sense and you know he's interested in the internet of things still in an academic way but not in a practitioner way like he doesn't want to do that with his life but um if you think about if if we try to think about stuff as a straight line then it's like this rapid segue where it's like it, it just juts down and then you're in this other timeline but in fact there's a parallel kind of if we want to think it in straight terms it's like there's parallel timelines running like you know in in conjunction with each other but if it's a circular experience, then it's like intersecting loops that are feed, you know, like feedback into each other, maybe like a figure eight or an infinity kind of symbol. Um, mm-hmm. Or everything is just going out and coming back in. And um, yeah, I think I think the more we can get away from this very linear thinking, this Western style of linear straight lines, probably the more fulfilling most of your experiences will be because you'll see it as cumulative and you also yeah. be aware of the mystery of not yeah. knowing the next yeah. loop is 
because you didn't, you know, so because it's about, you know, people thinking kind of straight lines when they think about, for instance, their careers, you know, you have to, they have this goal and they have to reach the goal. What if you didn't reach the goal? Then it's like unfulfilling when actually, what, what do we mean? You know, <laughs> it's not, you know, that's obviously, and it's a bit a cliche, obviously, but it's about the journey and not the goal, right? But there's such a truth in that. If you don't, if you just don't, you know, if you go through, like my daughter, she's a, you know, she's 16, almost 17, real teenager, hates school. Um, and and I was like, ah, oh, you know, uh, but she's just, you know, she wants to get rid of school. That's all her goal is kind of get that <laughs> behind her, right? That's all. And then, but not being able to, you know, enjoy or at least understand what you're experiencing in the moment. I know that's because you're a teenager, it's, but if you... But if you are able to sit back and say, you know, this is happening, that can be something bad. Mm. I mean, there's lots of bad things happening, uh, you know, in most people's lives to, at, at any given time. But you can also go like, huh, you know, it's it's a, it's something I'm experiencing. And so being able to have that moment of reflection or, or being a little bit, you know, on, a, on another level going like, hey, this is happening instead of just going to wanted to get rid of things, you know, get over it. And then, and just don't, don't realize it because I think that's such a, uh, I don't know, that's such an interesting thing. If you think about that, it, it, the way you're talking about it, you know, being sort of having this circular way of thinking about it instead of a linear, which make total sense, obviously as, as, as creative people and designers. And cause that's how we work. We, you know, mm. yeah, that's a really fascinating and it, reminds, um, it reminds me of this, like, um, I, it's probably not founded on psychology, but some, you know, some Instagram armchair psychologists have this nice little post saying, if you keep finding yourself in the same situations, it's still, there's still a lesson there for you. And if you think about it, like stories, right? Stories are meant to, um, to, to, to share it, to, to inspire us or to move us or impact us in some way. And if we keep coming across the same thing, uh, it's also... There's this, and when you're talking about the figure eight or or something, I also had this really nice mental image of like a spiraling cyclone. So you start at the bottom and then for, for the podcast listeners, I'm making movements with my hands. So I'm going to try to use my words, <laughs> but, uh, but you start, you start at the bottom in this cycle and it's just like a big coil, right? Like a Chris, like a coils upward into the cyclone or tornado funnel shape. And then it's, it circles, but that everything keeps just expanding and getting bigger and everything beautiful and interesting and worth exploring and investigating falls because it's still the circles but they get bigger and yeah now in my mind i'm now seeing this cyclone sucking up homes and caravans <laughs> and, and cows and like yeah you know, it's all part of my story people yeah you know, like... birthday's <laughs> home is like spiraling over to oz right now yeah, yeah. yes <laughs> no place exactly. like home yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um okay so uh megan i i um i want to um so because you're you're going to be you're going to be an actor apparently that's your new an actor you are yeah but you're, that's your new kind of that's your what you're going to explore more of is that is that right yeah. is that something you're going to uh, invest more time in and yeah like yeah yeah 100 percent. yeah yeah Yep. It's, it's not, it's, it's just the beginning. Um, definitely not going to stop doing it now that I've started again. I mean, it's def it's a, it's a complete and total love affair. Like as soon as I started doing it, I thought, why did I ever stop? Why did I stop? I don't know. I think it, well, I do know. I mean, part of it is, you know, when you're starting a business, you're all in or you're out. There's no kind of, I kind of run a business, <laughs> you run a business. So, yeah. you know, um, I'm, I've been doing it for 11 years now. So the amount of brain space that I need to, you know, deliver is not the same as it was, right? I don't need to um, come up with new products or, or you know, the way that I format my projects. I understand exactly how much time it takes me and I have a huge you know, like story toolbox to take things from. So, you know, the development time is different. So it's, and you know, when, like, when you have 10 years of experience and someone says, what do you think? 
I know what I think because I've been doing it for 10 years. So it's it's like a very different, a different experience once you reach a certain level of maturity with, you know, with your um, career. Um, and so, yeah, the storytelling stuff is 100% still going, but the acting is also 100% still going. So, yeah, so it's an interesting kind of turning point in my life. Um, and yeah, I have a lot of friends that are like, Oh, but you know, like that, that's a big step to make. And I, I'm like, is it, you know, I, I plan on living a lot longer. So I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, and as an actor, that's basically the last thing you'll do. So, cause, right. yeah. Yeah. You act until you, you literally <laughs> can't get out of bed. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> yeah. So it's a good pension plan, really. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Diversifying my income streams, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it is. Well, it's interesting, I think, for a lot of, I think that's part of also, um, you know, if you see yourself as a as a creative, that's, that's it's not a job. Right? No. And, and, and it kind of, and then I think your, your canvas, you know, whether that's acting or storytelling or a business, or at least in my experience, that doesn't really matter. So I think in that sense, you know, is it a big transition? Why? Because you you'll use your same kind of toolkit mm -hmm. and your experience. You just grew until you know uh, since the you know when you acted before, you know you changed because you have so much more kind of experience and the stories basically in you, but you're still the same person so it's kind of yeah. interesting in a way your circular kind of uh kind of uh, thinking that you know now you're you're back you're going to be an, um, an actor again um but it changed because mm -hmm. your the context changed and yeah. your experience has changed so it's really interesting to see um what's happening is is going to happen next yeah um yeah I mean, I basically I'm doing what I did when I was 12. You know, I write yeah. stories all day and I act. <laughs> you know, like, I don't. Yeah. I do. I'm the same, but I'm obviously you know a lot older now. But I mean, you know, the my point of view on these things have changed. My life experiences I bring into it are vastly different. But I'm I'm actually I've come full circle in that way. I've come right back kind of where I started. Exactly. So exactly. yeah. Yeah. Cool. Next time we'll talk, she'll have talked to another nun again. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. it's such a great example of a story. The nun, the nun story is such a great example of a story that kind of, if you share that story, it tells you some, you know, tells everyone who's listening who you are and what you're about. Yeah. You know, it's such a wonderful example of a story where you go like, you know, because I, I, you know, if I, if I teach people about storytelling in business, I, I do also have them collect or because that's a mental thing. That's a really difficult thing to do. You go like, you know, collect stories, write them down that, you know, communicate something about you, who you are, mm -hmm. what you're about. And this is for a leadership training. So mm -hmm. what kind of, if you want to communicate something, you want people to see you as a certain person, what is the story? you know, that, you know, that, that actually shows who you are. Yeah. What did you go through? What experience do you have? What could be bad, could be good, doesn't matter, but it's more like that. It should be a real story about you. Mm -hmm. And, and so I think that's such a, um, I don't know, that's so interesting to in that sense. So stories like your story about the nun, that's exactly a story that people would like that you'll never forget because it's exactly, you know, no, but nobody will forget that story. <laughs> you're like, uh, yeah. <laughs> That's very, it's funny. It's it's, but it's also you also know that it must have been, um, you know, really frustrating also, and uh, you know, there's everything's there. So that's the start. And if, you know, if you, whenever I don't know if you ever written that story, uh, uh, but that's a good story. That's could be a yeah. good, good story to write. Yeah, I have not. That's not one that I've written, but I've told it a number of times, like many, yeah. many times. <laughs> yeah, 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 of course, yeah. of course, yeah. because it's such a powerful story yeah. about who you are and it gives you the information right there. Yeah. A little tiny little story. Yeah, yeah. Five uh, minutes. Questioning. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs>
Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah. So thank you very much. I, I, I really enjoy. I could I could talk to you for for another hour. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I really want to thank you, and uh, we will. I hopefully talk again, um, and then uh, um, you know see how your acting career is going. And, yeah. Um, uh, so be really cool. Um, so thank you so much for the conversation. I, I really enjoyed it. And, yeah, thank you. Yeah. It was a, a real pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. And um, yeah, I can't wait. I can't wait to keep you updated on, <laughs> on what happens next. Yeah. <laughs> I need to hear about it. Yeah, thanks for sharing. <laughs> My pleasure.